Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity to rise to make a modest contribution to the debate on the Appropriation Bill 2019-2020. Madam Speaker, may I begin by congratulating warmly and proudly colleagues on this side of the House for the contributions they have made in the budget debate since Friday last. We have had colleagues on this side of the House speaking to policy, to programs, to ideas, to vision. And I congratulate all my colleagues who have spoken on this side. <laughs> Madam Speaker, colleagues who spoke really took a chapter, a few pages, out of the comprehensive presentation made, which I believe is a first in the history of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, Madam Speaker, the leader of the opposition presented, in a strange way, not so much an opposition replied as an alternative development agenda. And uh, without, at that time, without any election in sight, because the election, an election, I think, was declared during the speech, speech yeah. with no election in sight and no date named, the leader of the opposition had the courage the imagination and the vision to lay out a plan. To tell the country squarely, these are the problems and this is what we intend to do. That took courage. Because the leader of the opposition also told the national community, I now invite you to comment, to debate. So the leader of the opposition came with her plan. They came pelting stones after. They came ready to knock down everything said. But it is very critical that the country at this time understand the position of the opposition and the leader of the opposition. I think, I think persons are generally fed up with the tit for tat. I blame you, you blame me. The majority of persons in this country want to know what will you do to deal with the crisis, to address the problems and to bring home. And you could not have had a more hopeful, optimistic presentation than the member for Separia, and we congratulate her and her hardworking team. Madam Speaker, it is with a more than a bit of pleasure that I speak today with pride and humility to deliver my response to the budget statement. This budget, many call it a light bulb budget. This budget, Madam Speaker, and I agree with the member. You know, when the member for Separia finished, there was a response from Lavantil West. He was at his nastiest best. <laughs> and I took note of that response. I will speak to that. But I agree with him in one regard. It was in a painful and diabolical way a work of art. Because the minister, in speaking the Monday before in the budget presentation, there was something Shakespearean. There was something Napoleon. There was something Carney Central Orwellian about that presentation. When he was finished, they all jumped in the air. It was Orwellian. <laughs> to congratulate him in that way for his budget uh, presentation, which had several points of deception, which I will come to later. It was Napoleon because a couple days after, hours after, I believe, telling us about the great work that you are doing to alleviate flooding, he was caught, elevated somewhere in Port of Spain, docking water. <laughs> Madam Speaker, that was Napoleon in that sense. And it had a bit of Sir Walter Scott <laughs> in that he, his objective was to weave a tangled web. To deceive. To deceive. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first... We practice to deceive, and we will come to that. So it was a work of art. We must conclude. Madam Speaker, if ever a depressed country needed inspiration, it is now. If ever a crime-ridden society needed a beacon of hope, it is now. If ever this country needed the United National Congress, it is now. Our republic is unrecognizable from the paradise we left in September 2015. Today, today people complain that they have rain, but they don't have water. Yeah. Yeah. We complain 
about the hopelessness and the despair. Madam Speaker, the statistics, the, the Minister of Finance gave us his a custom and familiar national growth rhetoric. Today, the member for Carony Central was at his wit's end to understand this, the figures and suggested with some validity that the minister had taken the CSO and move it home. <laughs> so in the morning, he prepares cereal, milk, egg, and just cook up the figures as he go along because we have nothing else except the minister of finance. <laughs> Madam Speaker, under the regime of Diego Martin West, this society has a life that is nasty, brutish, and short. There was a time when our people had jobs, when they had food, when they had water, when they had schools, when they had shelter. That time was prior to September 2015. Madam Speaker, the, the population can't wait for a general election. Many citizens in this country tell you whether you meet them in the junction in Debe, in Point Fortin, in Arima, in the Queen's Park Oval, they say we can't take this suffering much more. People feel genuine pain in this nation today. The morbid confession of the Minister of Finance, who uttered a sick boast that serious crimes were done, but more innocent people were being killed every day, suggests that this government is out of touch with reality. In his three-hour, 20-minute presentation, he gave no hope, no assurance, no vision. Did not suggest that he had a clue as to what to do to save this nation. After his lengthy presentation, the economists, the financial experts, the accountants, the civil society leaders all asked for more detail after he spoke for three hours and 27 minutes. They couldn't believe. Citizens were just happy that this is his last budget although he has threatened otherwise. I'm almost tempted to say that we have survived, but we have a few more months to go. Madam Speaker, the minister had neither rhyme nor rhythm. It was uninspiring. At the end, he raised his arms like Sugar Ray Leonard, punched the sky. His colleagues in, Orwellian, in an Orwellian moment pounded the desk, only to discover that he bowled a no ball. <laughs> You would think it was a coincidence that the minister's budget speech was timed so well with the release of the Hollywood blockbuster thriller, The Joker. Indeed, Minister Imbert's descent into madness surpassed that of the failed comedian Arthur Fleck. Regrettably, the member for Diego Martin Northeast is real, and his reign of ter terror will last for more than 122 minutes. The minister's presentation was disturbingly familiar. 90% of the measures in the budget were repeats and rehash. Often with some obscene, obscenity, there were places in the budget where the minister repeated himself in the same budget presentation, Madam Speaker. He repeated not only the annual promises, but he, re but but he, he now called for a book. Obscenity. Member for... Uh, or Pooch East, please continue. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, through you, I, I assure the, minute, the member for St. Joseph there's nothing to fear. I will not look in his direction. <laughs> the minister repeated promises even in the document, suggesting that several persons have been writing and the minister did not read the, the document in its entirety. He did not read it. So there was this concentration on repeating promises from last year and in one case, in national security, I'll come through later, it is the exact wording that they repeated this year. And of course, topping off everything with bulbs for all. When our administration under the member for Siparia gave laptops to all, they today gave bulbs for all. They practice to deceive. So they suggest a little crumbs here, a little crumbs there, honestly believing that they can pull off a political Stockholm syndrome. Where you oppress, you abuse, and then you show some benevolent dictatorship, and the people will love you. Yeah. Mm. But Madam Speaker, a key part of this was this trickery, which the Guardian newspaper pointed out on Sunday. That trickery involving CPAP workers and URP workers. Madam Speaker, member for Karenis and others have spoken to this. I will just reiterate one point. The government felt because it is an election, they must announce CPEP and URP. 
So he announced an increase in the minimum wage from $15, which the partnership government set. $15, we raised minimum wage price. He announced that, and because the member wanted to tell URP and CPEP workers, I'm doing something for you, he had to call their name. Madam Speaker, quickly, I remember once on a flight coming from London to Port of Spain, when we were in office, and a flight attendant came up to me and said, Sir, I have something special for you. So I said, yes, of course, I accept. And a pastry came. I felt so good. But I'm when I look around, everybody in the cabin had the same pastry. <laughs> but at first, I, I thought was, this was only me getting this wonderful pastry. Okay. Okay. The minister said, CPEP workers, I have this for you. Yeah. URP, I have this for you. And the raise he gave them was less than the minimum wage. <laughs> so 7,000 CPEP workers are receiving $15 an hour. The minister said, I give you 15%, but the minimum wage raised by 16.6%. .6%. So what did you do? When he got caught, the member for Separia exposed him. Exposed him. On Friday last, minister from Lavantel West said, no, 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 they can't understand what we're talking about. So now they start a whoop. They said, no, the, the, the increase of 15% is on the new minimum wage. So now they have to tell the people whether the increase in URP and CPEP is 31.6% increase because you will get the new minimum wage and 15% on that. But if you do that, you crush the wage differential. You crush the wage differential because then the, the lowest paid worker will get more than the wakaman, the checker, the field officer. So they, they can't be thinking of that, but they got caught because they, they did not think it out. It is nonsense, utter nonsense. And the minister went on to insult and embarrass an academic uh, writer and, and speaker and so on. And this is their pattern. You see, Madam Speaker, there's something deeper here. Regimes like these, they intimidate, they harass, they undermine professionals, intellectuals, academics, trade union leaders, civil society leaders. So you mute them. So they are scared because the academic is generally not a politician like us. So, you know, we take a little talk and so on, we wake up the next day. But you're hoping that they will hide and they will shut up and they will not be critical of you. And that is the threat that the minister posed. So that the minister can tell us in his winding up or before, what exactly are you giving CPEP workers? Is it? And you decrease the allocation? And Dr. Ragunat exposed them that they decreased the allocation by $21 million. So you come to increase labor costs with a decreased allocation. And then, playing smart with foolishness, indicate to... Uh, it says it's numbers and everybody know we can have environment and appropriation, supplementation and so on. But when the national community and the international community get these yellow books, this is what they base the analysis of your economy on. This is what... So why did you give us this in the first place if it means nothing? If it's mere numbers... Madam Speaker, so Madam Speaker, he got caught with that. The daily paid, pension for daily paid. We clap, they hit the table and so on. What is happening here? The minister is now starting a process of negotiations with the worker organization, asking them, so what all you want? How all you want this pension to be arranged? Nothing is arranged. That is a matter that requires process, a management committee, dialogue, negotiations, and so on. That kind of pension scheme. Mama guy again. Mama guy again because what they will do, I understand what they will do. As it is now, when the daily paid, most of the daily paid go home at 60 years. They wait for five years to get old age pension. And that is adjusted with NIS in mind because they would have paid NIS. But the minister, what, what the minister say, pension for you. If that is not negotiated and settled, a contributory pension, it is the same thing they had before, a pension at 65, which is old age pension. So again, having negotiated nothing, you, you set out to deceive daily paid workers that pension for you. When is this pension going to come? You know, this pension matter started in 1994 under Patrick Manning. This is why the age of retirement, uh, Kuva South, went down in 1994. We had done the work with former minister Larry Hawaii and others, and we had completed that by about 75, 80%. Like the Ramai Trace Hindu school, you never complete it, Arima. Where is the pension of the school? So that 
they, they will take time, their term of office will finish, and there will be no contributory daily paid uh, pension. That is, a, that is a point. Madam Speaker, and I want to make the point because, you know, they'll get up after and say, well, we have something against the environment and bulb and so on. Mm -hmm. Giving bulbs to people is not, not, in principle, is not bad because you want to save energy and so on. But that is a matter for ministry, a division in a ministry, working with private sector, working with groups. It cannot be that you, so you're going in West Moorings and go up with a, a cart and give somebody in West Moorings and say, how much bulb are you using? 20? Look, 20 bulb. So there... It is just there to create that impression. So they increase the salary for OJT and fire all the UTT workers. <laughs> that is how they operate. And there's a narrative coming from that side. Now, it's very interesting, this narrative. They are saying as they go along, there are several issues all ministers repeat, you know. We are so happy that we have been steady the ship. Sure. And, and first, they say not, not a man lost their job. Yeah. Hmm. They started that. When man and woman lost their job, they say we're happy to say Notwithstanding the 63,000 who lost their job, that not one gazetted public officer has lost their job. So the 63,000 people this morning are happy because they, you know, what happened is that they're not gazetted. So they would have still been in UTT, they would have still been in all the ministries, they would have still been in Petrotrin if they were gazetted. And they don't know what gazetted means. That is the trickery that this government comes with. All of them repeated now they're not gazetted, so they're working. So that they spend the money on castles while the people eat cake. That is what they do. They spend the money on castles. And I want to deal with another myth quickly. I want to deal with another myth quickly. You know, all of them are trained to say something. When they reach in power, there was no money. There was no money running on fumes and so on, all of them. They're trained. They have that mantra. They got a book and they read it. The deception. When we left office, Madam Speaker, when we left office, other speakers alluded to it, Madam Speaker, when we left office, we left them with a stable economy, with reserves, Madam Speaker. We, and the member for Kearney Central set it out properly. I think he, he did everything, told us about that. I want to repeat that. But I'm going to ask them, where you all get money? For $200 million to upgrade Skinner Park. $2.5 million US for Michael Bolton and Tony Braxton in Tobago. $100,000 to mind your business um, seminar. Where did you get $115 million for the Diggo Martin Stadium? $777,000 for BMW for the THA. A new headquarters of $60 million for Minister Moses. $32 million to restore Whitehall. A zoo project of $60 million. $7.6 million for Hilton swimming pool. Where you got that from? You got a hand from Susu? You got that from Susu? This is their spending and their waste since they came into office. $3.5 million on a CL financial sexual harassment charge matter. They paid. Roman bill $59,000. $92,000 rump in Tobago. Massey Communications, 225 million. Yes. Lobbyists in America, 18 million. Petrotrin Consultants, $63 million we paid to close down Petrotrin. $110 million for the Brian Lara Stadium, where you cannot play an international cricket match yet in that stadium. Madam Speaker, I could go on and, and with this soaker on the seas, $3 million. But the, the one paintings, three million. So that was the next Susuhan brought in that money. You didn't get it from the last administration. The Prime Minister residence in Tobago, 20 million and counting. And counting. Golf course, 0.25 million. Madam Speaker, I can continue, but it's too much and I have limited time. Madam Speaker. So they, about 10 pages of that. But they, they, they have this mantra. They left us with no money, and we had no money to do this. Had no money to finish school. No money. No money to finish community centers. No money for food card, but had money for all of that. Golf course, paintings, castles. That is what they had money for. Carols and castles. Today, Madam Speaker, they, they have said that the, the government cannot run a refinery, but they want to open daycare centers. Yeah, they can't run the refinery. 
what business, that is a matter that you work with civil society, the social uh, organizations, and you run daycare centers. So, Madam Speaker, to this year budget, they didn't tell us anything about the game changers. Game changers, Madam Speaker. Dragon gas, gone. Sandals, gone. Housing, gone. And next year, p &M, gone. Because they know, as we know, they cannot finish any large-scale project in 10 months or so. You, can, you may not even start. I have a gift for these ministers. I've bought 30 yards of ribbon, and I'm not going to give them. Because all they will do is cut ribbon whole year. <laughs> and I will get somebody to buy a fork for them, because that's the next thing they will use a lot in the coming days. I won't say anything about that. And a shovel. They're only digging up the land and cutting the ribbon. Nothing will be delivered by any one of them. You see, Madam Speaker, I will speak to some of these issues. The last um, speaker before me made an interesting point um, about the work they're doing in Tobago and so on. And we remembered in Tobago, it was under Shogwana's education centers developed, schools, training facilities. Madam Speaker, the PNM talk, the UNC works. In housing, in housing, Madam Speaker, I don't think today, apart from a few houses here, 10, 5 or so on, they have actually taken over the role of Habitat for Humanity. <laughs> Habitat for Humanity is a great organization that builds a few houses every year for underprivileged people, and we support that. Government is meant to build more, to do more in the sector. They boast, they give away 71 houses here and 25 here. Madam Speaker, under the Partnership Administration, we were giving out 100 homes per week. Huh? That is it. So while the PNM talks, the UNC works. Under the CPEP, we talk about environment, we pick up 50,000 tons of garbage a month with CPEP Marine. They talk, we work, Madam Speaker. And they come now with the audacity of talking about corruption and so on. Madam Speaker, the, the other point I make quickly, Udicott. And I make this on behalf of residents. And I'm shocked that San Fernando East and San Fernando West spoke in this debate and didn't mention anything. Udicott has moved from the premier project manager of the Caribbean under the Partnership Administration to organize our FET. I think they're building a swimming pool, one or two swimming pool, Udicott. And... They're organizing FET. They have a July 14th, Madam Speaker, 2019. Would you believe Udicott puts out an ad in the newspaper? The event, uh, we, we're encouraging you to apply and, and contact us if you want to have wedding, meeting, parties. Government. This is a government project manager inviting people in an ad to contact them if you want to have a party, a wedding, a FET. You know what they have done? They have turned the Brian Lara Stadium into a FET center. And 15,000 people in Point up here, San Fernando East, San Fernando West, cannot sleep in the night because they fed, they make the noise and disturb people. I met an Irish gentleman on the weekend, and he told me this is the only thing he wants me to say is that elderly people in the night when the weekend come. You know, long time you say look forward to a weekend? These people cringe and they dread when the weekend comes because they cannot sleep. They make noise the whole night. And Judicott is encouraging that at the Brian Lara because they, they close Skinner Park, so all the FETs coming there. Yeah, they are FET promoter, Madam Speaker. The, the lady from Tobago East spoke earlier, the member, and said member for Siparia did not have authority to speak on anti-corruption matters and so on. I think she was saying that. Now, that you could say that, and your prime minister went to a joint select committee and announced that there was corruption in the tendering and processes for a boat. He announced it. He didn't wait for us to tell him that. He did it himself, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, I just want to update the record because somebody need to. You see, Madam Speaker, one year ago, I raised certain matters in this parliament. I raised certain matters. And Madam Speaker, they beat me from pillar to post. Madam Speaker, I was encouraged to go out on the pavement on the road, in the river, and in the sea. They put me everywhere in the world, Madam Speaker, and they beat me. 
the Prime Minister, I just want to, I just want to remind the national community, Madam Speaker, when I finished making my presentation on that occasion, headlines the next day read like these. Rudal Munilal raised allegations in Parliament October 9th. That is one year and one week to this day. Prime Minister responds in Parliament, I have no U.S. bank accounts. Prime Minister says documents and email stated in allegations are false. October 10th, Prime Minister has confirmed that the other party, Rawlinson Rowley, the man on the receiving end of the email, is indeed his cousin. The next day, Dr. Rowley's cousin says the email was sent to him, but by accident. October 11th, admitting that the bank account number is real, CNC International Trading has said they have a business relationship with a South construction company, contracting company. Fake oil in the fake oil um, scandal. October 12th, and many articles I would stop here. October 12th, the checks I had raised and so on on that day. You see, Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister made a commitment, and I don't want to get in it quoted extensively now, but the Prime Minister said the next day he was furious. Well, he is always furious, but he was mad. And he said he calls upon the police commissioner, the financial intelligence unit, and it's his attorney general to investigate what Munilal said in parliament and make the findings public. It is in the newspaper. One year and one week later, where are the findings? Where are the findings? The attorney general spoke last week Friday. I didn't know he was taking off. And in the last year of the administration, well, he could go to France. Madam Speaker, in the last year of the administration, they will all run up miles. They will run up their air miles, so when they demit office, they could go to cricket free. So, Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister said, I'll ask these agencies. I demand them, investigate that, and make the findings public. I have nothing to fear. One year and one week later, not one police, financial intelligence bureau, attorney general, have made any findings public. Not one. And when that was happening, Madam Speaker, when that was happening, Madam Speaker, I could tell you, when that was happening, I, because I made the allegations, I had a duty, Madam Speaker, to continue on that matter, because you know why? I raised the matter. And if they would not investigate, I would investigate. Madam Speaker, all I can... Madam Speaker, I know my colleagues are now on the edge of their seats. Of and I assure you, I will not run afoul of the standing order. I spent a year in, a, in another place with that. So I assure you. But I know you will be on the edge of your seat. Madam Speaker, I investigated because they won't. The only thing I could not investigate is something in another jurisdiction because I did not have that kind of authority, power, or institution. But certainly in this country, we, have, we can investigate. Madam Speaker, the checks I raised, Republic Bank has confirmed that they are real and they have the video wow. of the person making that. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the emails are real and I could tell you without doubt that I am a person, anybody could call me and talk to me, I, I'm afraid. Indeed, I will tell you, I have met the cousin named in that and had discussions with him, Mr. Ralston Rowley. A gentleman, a gentleman, a gentleman. And he tells me, he says, Rudy, I really got the thing by mistake. It was in the spam, but it was not meant for him. I said, if you say so, it's so. He said, I have no business in that. I said, okay, if you say it's like that, it's like that. I can't doubt you, Madam Speaker. I didn't doubt him at all because I thought that he was speaking, Madam Speaker, um, you know, in an honest manner and so on. And nothing is wrong with that. Madam Speaker, when we did further research, we found that there were actually, we got the date of email sent. We got text messages suggesting that those things are real, are real. So I was never, they never proved that what I said was wrong, was malicious, inaccurate. You can never prove that. Madam Speaker, I have in my hand, which I will not show, I will not raise and show people anything again. I have in my hand, I have in my hand, you know, printouts of, uh, what's it called, snapshot of text messages and so on, confirming this matter of coordinates and banking coordinates to be sent, and who it is to be sent to, and what is to be wired, and so on. So, I don't want to go there. Madam Speaker, there are two matters related to that that I will go to, certainly. Huh? 
I want to go to eagerly. How much time? Let's check the time of normal time. Yeah. Madam Speaker, it came to my attention. I was connecting the dots because they left me, they left me stranded in the middle of the river. Because they would not investigate, I had to investigate. Madam Speaker, when we dig deeper, there is a, a pattern emerging. A tangled web. A tangled web. We try our best to connect the dots with our limited capacity because we are not, institutions of law enforcement are not available that way. Madam Speaker, there's a transaction and I call no name. And nobody will entice me to call names. <laughs> Madam Speaker, there's a transaction emerging and I have in my hand the email which I will read. And I assure you, I know everybody is now on edge. It is not a fake email. It is from one David Goldberg to Vidya Deuki Singh at yahoo.com. We have it here. And the email is from David Goldberg. I must tell you, David S. Goldberg is an attorney at law in Maryland, United States. That is near Washington, isn't it? Yeah. Is it? yeah. David S. Goldberg is a, is a United States attorney. And he's writing on February 23rd, 2015 at 1 19 p.m. And he says, Dear Mr. Deuki Singh, Mr. Deuki Singh is an individual who has been named in that fake oil scandal. He's a former candidate for the PNM in Siparia, a close friend of the Prime Minister, a colleague, this man called Deuki Singh. Dear Mr. Deuki Singh, attach, please find a copy of a receipt of outgoing wire transfer to Formula One trading in the amount of 550,000 United States dollars. Wow. I repeat, please find a copy of the receipt of outgoing wire transfer to Formula One trading in the amount of 550,000 United States dollars. He's sending it to Mr. Deuki Singh. So a lawyer in America, Maryland, is, is sending this. Thank you for your cooperation. If you have additional questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. It is David Goldberg, dsgoldberg112 at gmail.com. Madam Speaker, and a wire transfer is attached. Now, again, a wire transfer is not a bank account. So people mustn't jump up and say, I have no bank account. I, uh, it is not. And they know it too. Madam Speaker, the wire transfer speak to this money being deposited in an account, Formula One, in Georgetown, Guyana, where they operate, Madam Speaker. And there are all the information concerning that, including additional instructions and beneficiaries. Madam Speaker, I say no more. The beneficiaries, if known to you, will again blow your top. It is a Wells Fargo account. 550,000 United States dollars. Wire transfer to Guyana Formula One. Madam Speaker, attention, Vidya Deuki Singh. But I'll come to our next name related here. Three million, three million Tobago dollars. February 23rd, 2015. 3.5. Madam Speaker, there's a CC on this email that had me thinking and led me somewhere else. You see, out of office we can still do. The, it is copied to one Ed Kane. It's eckane443 at gmail.com. Now, who is Ed Cain? Who he, as we say? Madam Speaker, when we did our investigations, Ed Cain is a player, like a lobbyist almost, working with Mr. Deuki Singh on projects. Whether the projects are the trading in fuel, whether they are involving different companies, but they operate United States, Guyana, and Madam Speaker, Suriname. And that took me to Suriname. Madam Speaker, luckily, when I spent my time in Holland, I did learn some Dutch. <laughs> so they could not have escaped me. Because one of the things they would do is try to use another language. Madam Speaker, Ed Kane is known to Vidya Deuki Singh. And they have been involved in some business in, in, involving fuel trading and so on. Madam Speaker, this Ed Kane and Deuki Singh work together. Formula One is a real company. They were transferring. There's a wire transfer here. Now, I assure members, you cannot hide these things. Yes. These things, you can't hide that way. Well, they don't erase. You know, you can't, you can't ask a party member working in a bank, go, and, go on the computer and punch it out. They don't erase like that. And Madam Speaker, I come now to a matter that is related to this. You see, Madam Speaker, the Minister of Finance announced in his budget the sale of the refinery. 
He did it in a, a minister's statement earlier, but then comes in the budget and repeated more or less the same thing. You see, Madam Speaker, the minister and his government thought, they thought, wrongfully, they would set a fox trap for the opposition. They thought they would set a trap where if we raise any issue, we don't like the workers. If we raise any issue, we don't like OWTU. If we raise, we against locals. And I have a feeling this government actually named that company patriotic, you know. Because for four years, they're accusing us of being unpatriotic. So what do we do? Madam Speaker, in the opposition, we have said we are happy, we are pleased that if any local company or group of companies are to be given the refinery, we wish it would be local. Madam Speaker, the, we do not want the OWTU to fail, Madam Speaker. We want them to succeed. And we, I call on the OWTU today, do not be conned by this government. Do not get mamagai by the government that may have some other interest in this matter that they will not tell us at this time. You see, Madam Speaker, uh, 15 years ago, more or less, something happened in this country that led to almost the collapse, and I think the collapse of the oil sector. It was Malcolm Jones, Ken Julian, and Lenny Seth. Politicians before us were in the house, in the Red House. Our predecessors generally. Some of us were there, but a bigger group. They raised their voices when they saw what was happening. That administration ignored us. And today, all gone because of the decisions that they took. What is our job as the opposition? Do we stay quiet? Do we, do we just go in a corner and stay quiet and say, we don't want to say anything because um, they will say we don't like them? No. Madam Speaker, we have a serious duty. We have taken an oath to be fair and to conduct our duties without fear or favor. Madam Speaker, refinery is $5 billion plus dollars. As it is now, it belongs to all of us. Exactly. We own the refinery at this time, you know. This is our property, the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And, and they, they have mortgaged the refinery and all other properties and assets there. And secretly think they could get away with it. Madam Speaker, this is a refinery in which between the Manning administration and the Siparia, member for Siparia administration, do you know this country invested $1.6 billion in that refinery between 2006 and 2013? $1.6 billion US dollars invested, and today they tell us we shouldn't say anything about that. Don't talk about that. 11 billion TT dollars, as if that is the amusement park in, in Arango, Savannah. That is a refinery owned by the people, and we should raise our voices on the matter. Madam Speaker, some time ago, I read in the newspaper, it was in October 2018, about a company that was supporting in this matter, a company called Sunstone Equity. Sunstone Equity is operating out of Suriname. And they were identified early as a private investment firm to help in the bids. Madam Speaker, when I heard this company was in Suriname, I immediately asked some friends of mine to check it out, tell me. Yes, and I prat in Netherlands, but I asked them to te please tell me what is happening with this company. Because normally, if you're going to buy a refinery, you think always that you know, it will be some companies known to you, but not companies that are unknown. Madam Speaker, would you believe that this company named Sunstone, that is identified to assist in purchasing and private investment and so on. This company is operating out of a building in Suriname that is a lodge for visitors. The office is behind a lodge. Like a travel lodge, like a travel lodge where you go and you sleep and you get up in the morning and move on. Right. In the back, they have an office here. It's called Sunstone Equity. They're like Bridgman. And they, are like Bridgman before with the boat. The same thing like Bridgman. They are operating in Suriname. Madam Speaker, the principal of that is someone called John Ewald Van Dyke. John Ewald Van Dyke. So we check him out again. He's Dutch-Canadian. And Madam Speaker, he's, he's spoken about this matter. He's real, I must tell you, he's real, because he has, he has interest in this business and so on. When you look, John Van Dyke is really a political economist writer. He writes books like Jeffrey Harrod and others on political economy and support progressive organizations and doing their international research work and so on. He has written a book called Casino Capitalism. This person is behind Sunstone, who we expect will get 700 million US dollars to purchase a refinery. Could you imagine that? 
This person is involved, is a writer, is an author. He's not a businessman of anything we know, but is an author who is the head of Sunstone that has an office in the back of a lodge, a travel lodge in Suriname, operating there, and is entering into deals with this government, Madam Speaker, to purchase refinery. That is a serious scandal about to happen. And Madam Speaker, I got the document in Dutch, and I have it in Dutch, and then, of course, I, I got someone to do it in English. Sunstone Equity has share capital and so on of 500 Suriname dollars, 5,000 Suriname dollars. Share capital, 5,000 Suriname dollars. Issue capital, 1,000 Suriname dollars. Paid in capital, 1,000 dollars. It was established, Madam Speaker, I mean, I pray that this is right. Uh, I mean, I hope it's translated properly. But the same date, actually. It was established on January 18, 2018. No. January 2018, time of commencement, no. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this company established in 2018 a commencement of their offices, but let me be absolutely correct. Date of creation of the company, when it was registered, was the 17th of September, 2015. So 15, they register and commence January 18, 2018. And this is a company involved, Madam Speaker, in providing financial support for a multi-billion dollar bid. $5 billion bid run by one gentleman who we have said is an academic writer of some kind and moving. Madam Speaker, when we did, when we did further research, Madam Speaker, I have in my hand, of course, Madam Speaker, the research material that we received elsewhere. Madam Speaker, would you believe that Mr. John Van Dyke visited Trinidad and Tobago? Yes. He was here. But how he came here? Who brought him here? Madam Speaker, you will not be surprised to know that Mr. John Vine and I came to Trinidad to find and be in the company of one Mr. Vidya Deuki Singh. Oh. Mr. Vidya Deuki Singh brought him here, Madam Speaker, to have meetings concerning business with stakeholders visiting a contractor in Penal. Visiting a contractor in the south of Trinidad, Madam Speaker. Visiting contractors in Penal. Madam Speaker, I have in my hand, which I will not show. I have in my hand, Madam Speaker. I have in my hand pictures, Madam Speaker. Which I will not show. Madam Speaker, I'm showing myself. I will cross my hand because I don't want to even pick it up. Madam Speaker, in this... In what is either an office or somebody's home, there are three persons signing documents here. Oh and one, two persons are very clear. They bear a great resemblance to one Mr. David Abdullah, Mr. Ansel Roger, and the third person indeed has been identified as John Van Dyke. Oh. Signing documents here and shaking hands and signing in either an office or house, we do not know. It may well be in a house in Pinal that they are signing documents involving serious negotiations with Sunstone Equity. Mm -hmm. Madam Speaker, I call upon the players today. Please, don't call me on the pavement and think no more. <laughs> uh, please. I call on the players to just indicate to the public when did this meeting take place? Where did this meeting take place? How this meeting take place? Uh, why? why this meeting took place? What are they signing? What are they signing? And could I ask them to, to confirm whether indeed Mr. Vidya Devuki Singh took the picture that I have in my hand? Oh. Hmm. Madam Speaker, the gentleman Mr. Van Dyke was also in Trinidad. We have a photo of him in a car here with other businessmen and so on, moving in Trinidad. If Madam Speaker, you see, it's easy to clarify this. All they have to say is, well, the picture can't be fake, I doubt, is that they were signing, I don't know, a collective agreement or something like that, or they were signing some other document that had nothing to do with refinery. Speaking of new bargaining, Susu plan. But you see, Madam Speaker, we cannot take lightly that the Minister of Finance announced, and I get back to the budget, that the only um, 
company that said they would pay cash up front is patriotic. Yes. And they were paying cash. Were they paying cash from Sunstone? And if the, all the companies, he said, the only one had cash was, was patriotic. And that's the only one we don't want cash from. <laughs> but that is a serious matter. Member for Orupuchi, your original time is now spent. You have 10 more minutes to wind up. Thank you very much. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I'm told that this, the, these uh, materials, Madam Speaker, where I got it from is actually the internet. And they are now available on the internet for others to see. That is where I got it from. Madam Speaker, the, we need clarity as to what is this gentleman doing, what deal, where. And we have confirmed in our own way, because as I said, we can't leave it for the government, that this gentleman has been a visitor, regular or otherwise, to a contractor in South Trinidad. And that contractor is indeed the, the premises of AV drilling. Yes, and Madam Speaker, is it that there is some backhand way for persons who have been accused of fake oil and others, other offenses? Is this a backhand way that they will now claim the refinery? Wow. After the taxpayer, after the taxpayer put $11 billion into the refinery, they will now claim it and look to make a profit, a good profit, because... The rumor down on that side, Madam Speaker, where we operate and where we come from, people are already telling us who they think own the refinery. Who? All in the family. Madam. All in the family, Madam Speaker. So that there are questions to answer. And when they are, and you see, Madam Speaker, I've connected the gentleman from Sunstone. I've connected, Sunstone has a relationship with Formula One. Formula One, recipient of cash to go to beneficiaries who I will not name. But the names are there. Why Mr. Goldberg is sending an email to Mr. Dave Kissing and copying Mr. Ed Cain? With a golden handshake. Madam Speaker, it is the web that they are, they are producing, Madam Speaker, and infiltrate in Trinidad to get their paws on the refinery. That is what they want. Madam Speaker, they must also tell us, because you see, we have made the connections now to that matter, that wire transfer. But don't forget there was a wire transfer issue raised last year involving, Madam Speaker, a wire transfer in Doral, Florida, a bank. Madam Speaker, I am told, I am told, I am told, Madam Speaker, that the money is still there, Madam Speaker. I am told that the money is still there. <laughs> Madam Speaker, on the internet now, they are saying that John Van Dyke of Sunstone Equity was hired by the OWTU to look into the viability of Petrotrin Refinery <laughs> and says the facility is very vi valuable. Well, I could imagine it is. Madam Speaker, the gentleman, the, you're getting it live and direct, and by nightfall, we will confirm... Well, I know, but others will confirm where that picture was taken, and they were signing deals. It is a done deal, Madam Speaker, and they come to fool. Madam Speaker, the wire transfer money that we spoke about last year is still in the bank in Doral, because after the mark bus, nobody, but nobody, brave to go in the bank. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I was tempted to go in Florida and say, I'm video, they were kissing, I come for my money. But I can't do that. I was tempted to do it, but I can't, and I won't do that, Madam Speaker, I won't. Madam Speaker, I won't. I don't want to get myself in more trouble. <laughs> but the wire transfer is still there. And right through the year, Madam Speaker, when we try through different means that are lawful, to begin with, are lawful to get information from the bank, the bank's position when contacted, the bank's position is, of course, they cannot breach clients' confidentiality. And this has, be, has to be done through institutions of law enforcement in one country to another. But the Attorney General spoke yes. early in this debate, said nothing. He told us, follow the money. And I would have thought the Attorney General, and connect the dots, I would have thought the Attorney General would have triggered the mechanism to go to Doral in Miami and just ask the bank, hello. Some person in Trinidad raised this matter. We think he is not telling the truth. But could you just confirm that this is not true through the mechanism 
of the Attorney General's office and the, the American Institute's uh, law enforcement in the, in the state of Florida. That is the easiest thing to do. We help them with legislation to do that. Madam Speaker. Yeah. In 2018, my, Madam Speaker, it's from 2018, yes. In October 2018, he confirmed his interest in the viability of the refinery. And he was hired by the OWTU. And with this link now to Vidya Deuki Singh, to AV Drilling in South, one wonders what has happened there. And we raise the issues. Because you see, Mrs. Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister cannot say he's not his friend now. Hmm. He can't say he's not his friend now. I am not accusing any member of parliament here of wrongdoing. All I am saying is that they could not at this time tell us about that bank wire transfer in Miami last week. And I just give you another one from the state of Maryland. In a bank now moving to Georgetown, Formula One. Formula One linked to Suriname. Operating in Suriname with a diesel trade business that was uh, operational when Petrotrin was alive. Wow. When Petrotrin was alive, there was a fuel trade taking place involving persons involved in Petrotrin and Suriname. A man was placed under house arrest in Suriname because of that. That deal went sour. Mr. Deuki Singh knows about it and he now comes up in a deal involving the refinery. Oh, what a tangled web we weave. You see, Madam Speaker, they can't tell me what I'm saying is not true because we also have banking documents from First Citizens Bank in Pinal, Madam Speaker. I never raised this before either, but there are banking documents from First Citizens Bank in Pinal suggesting that there we have another transfer, electronic funds transfer between AV Drilling Oil and Gas Limited to Doral, Florida, Regions Bank with Swift Code and everything. So look how it connects now. Pinal to Florida, to Washington, back to Guyana, Suriname. With beneficiaries that are identified. In Trinidad. In Trinidad. Two beneficiaries of Trinidadian descent. Known to many. But Madam Speaker, the government says nothing. And during the year, on another time, I only have, I think, three minutes or four minutes left. Madam Speaker, during the year, I was able to get some immigration records somehow. I don't know how. <laughs> but that do you know the Prime Minister traveled regularly because he's building miles now. So he traveled regularly, attending all type of things. Yeah. And there were persons involved in this matter who, when you look at their immigration record of travel, Madam Speaker, mm. almost match hmm. the travel and the flight oh. of officials of government. Including, Madam Speaker, a manifest from a private jet. Wow. A private jet left Piaco to, of all places, Caracas, Madam Speaker, and synchronized all the time with government officials traveling. Yes. What we are yet to trace, because we can't, because see, once you go in another jurisdiction, you are in a way out of my, my grab. <laughs> but one day, maybe the will of God and the will of Siparia. One day, we may be in a position to investigate. You see, Madam Speaker. One day, one day, we may be in a position to track a private jet from Piaco to Caracas and whether that jet connected the passengers to Holland, hmm. where they went for another conference. We will be able to connect all the immigration data to persons involved in this scandal. And that is why they will not easily relent and let go power. Because they know when those of us on this side get to that side, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, last year, when I finished talking last year, the member for Roka Maloney stood up and read a search warrant. Remember that? Today, when I finished, they will might stand up and read the sentencing. And you know, when they were pointing fingers at our side, they forget to look at their side. They forget to look at their side. And I, and I have a tip. I have a tip. For the member for Aruka Maloney. Careful. I have a tip. Careful. When you live in glass houses, you must, you must change your clothes in the basement. <laughs> That's my tip. Because the member for Aruka Maloney likes reading warrants. And I pray to God that no trouble will befall her, that she may not have to read her own. Mm. Madam Speaker, I pray to God because we are colleagues and we do not wish people bad.
Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, in winding up, there are questions I've raised. I'm sure colleagues opposite, I encourage them to get the answers. And if we are wrong, and you can disconfirm us, no problem. But if we are right, then you should hide. Madam Speaker.